right, so here's how this all got started. I, body language is the management of time, space, eye contact, gesture, uh, facial expression, stance, movement. And what I study is how body language impacts leadership effectiveness, particularly in things like managing change, uh, negotiation, sales, job interviews, um, dealing with multicultural international teams. And I also blog for Forbes. And that's what I blog on. I blog on mostly on body language and leadership. But last April, I did a blog on 12 ways to spot a liar at work. Now my blogs do, you know, you never know. Some blogs get a couple thousand. If it's really popular over time, it'll get to 20, 30, maybe 80,000. This blog in the first 10 days got 263,000 hits. <laughs> and I thought, well, OK, people are interested in that topic, as was I. And also, I thought it would be easy. Because here I was, practically an expert already. I mean, I had, uh, I had done a lot of research on nonverbal cues and, and lying. I was interested in the topic. And I thought it'll be easy to write the book. And what I found was I knew so little. First of all, I didn't know what a big liar I was. But secondly, I found out many, many things. And that's why I'm going to talk to you about a few of them today. First of all, you work with a bunch of liars. And they lie for a bunch of reasons. One of the things that I did was interview 547 people in the workplace to find out what kind of lies they were experiencing on a regular basis. And I found there was the, you know, from all levels, chief executive officers and senior leaders who, you know, gave sort of a um, rose-colored version of the truth, which, by the way, isn't looked at as, oh, well, we understand that's what you have to do. It's looked at as those people are lying to us. From coworkers who lie about, yes, I'll work on your team, and they really don't want to work on your team, and they're really not going to really participate, but they just had to say that, to all sorts of reasons that are very either self-serving. A lot of people lie to get out of things they don't want to do. A lot of people told me they lie to get out of meetings. Now, oh, no, I have something else I need to do, where really I just don't want to go to your meeting. Um, they lie on resumes. They lie. And they enhance you know, their ability. They got a degree that they really didn't get a degree. They went to a school they really didn't go to that school. They had so many years in the workplace that they embellished. They were really working you know, for their mom or something. I mean, it, they just embellished that. They also lie on exit interviews. They particularly lie on exit interviews when they think it's better for their career. I've had many people say, if I told the truth about why I'm leaving this company, it would be a career killer. So they lie from the time they get hired to the time they leave. They also, people also lie, of course, to avoid punishment. They lie to get out of things, like I said, that they don't want to do. And they you know, lie to cover their rear end. They didn't do something. And they lie about it in order so people don't find out that they didn't do that something. They also lie to protect other people. And here was the first thing that you find out in gender differences. Well, Everybody lies, and everybody lies about the same amount. Females tend to lie a little bit more to protect other people. And that's not always a great thing. One of my, many of my, but one I remember in particular said, you know something, it's really bad when I'm trying to give feedback because I try not to hurt their feelings. So I'm not giving really honest feedback. Now, what does that, even that woman said, and I'm working on that. I'm trying to get better at that. But I know it's really hard for me to do. So women, more than men, in my study anyway, will lie to kind of protect someone, which again may not be a great thing to do. And a lot of liars, of course, lie because it is the social glue that holds any kind of organization or family or relationship together. If you ask me how I am, you really don't know, or you really don't want to know how my entire day went. What you want me to say is, oh, I'm fine. How are you? That's what we expect. So we know we're set up for some kind of lies. Um, 
Some of the lies are, are wonderful. You might say, gee, Carol, that's a nice jacket. And I'll say, great, good thing they didn't notice the five pounds I gained over Mother's Day. You know what I mean? So it's lying by that kind of omission. Those are the kind of liars you want to thank. So we're surrounded by liars. Some lies are really great for business and really great for relationships. And some lies are absolutely damaging and destructive. And one of the big tricks is to weed out one kind from the other. So here's a question for you. How do you decide if someone you work with is trustworthy? How do you do it? How do you decide if somebody you go to school with is trustworthy? What do you do? How do you know? Tell me. I trust them until they prove me that I shouldn't. So you, you trust initially, and then you wait for some action. OK, in the back. So you build a trust by um, starting with something small, and they'll building up. So you build trust by, you, you see if they're trustworthy in smaller situations, and then you give them more information or more of your trust as they look like they deserve it. How else? Yeah. Yeah. You ask someone else, what have you heard about this person? What's their <laughs> reputation? What, what don't I know that I should? How else? You can see the eye contact. The eye contact. You made the way, oh, this is going to be good. We're going to talk about eye contact a lot in a little bit, but the way someone establishes eye contact. Anything else? Yes. Yes, and see how they react in the situation. So you break up with them before you date, then you see how. <laughs> you put someone in emotional stress to see how they react to that. You know, this is what audiences tell me all the time that trust is something that grows that has to be built, that you look for certain things. I want to show you how you really decide whom to trust. This is research from Princeton. What they have done, and I'll show you, I'm going to show you the little movie of it, is they say if you move three things on a face, eyebrows, cheeks, and chin, you can make a person trustworthy or untrustworthy. And that we decide if someone's trustworthy in about the first seven seconds of meeting them. Like we make all these other assumptions about people. Are they attractive? Are they someone we want to be with? Are they likable? All of that in the first seven seconds. So if the inner corners of your eyebrows are high, if your cheekbones are prominent, and if your chin is wide, you look trustworthy instantly. If your inner corners of your eyebrows are low, if your cheekbones are recessed, and if your chin is narrower, we don't trust you. They've also done one other thing in this little clip, and that is they've taken the corners of the mouth from up to down. Neutral, trustworthy, untrustworthy. Yeah, yeah, the shading. <laughs> so that's how quick it is. That's how fast we make a decision about other people. Biases, prejudices, assumptions are also right in our way when we go to find out if someone is trustworthy or if they're telling the truth. They interfere amazingly. If you are working with someone who is attractive, whose eyebrows are in the right place, who is powerful, who is charismatic, or who somehow reminds you of yourself. You tend to focus so much on those attractive qualities that you don't know you're being duped. That's exactly how it works. Here's some more biases that interfere with deception detection. One is that in-group, out-group bias. This is so strong. We create in-groups, out-group. Everybody that's here is an in-group. Those people that didn't get to hear this lecture, they're an out-group. Of course, let's they see the tape, then maybe they're an in-group. But right now, there's us and there's them. And we us and them all the time. We tend to trust people in an in-group much more than we trust people that are dissimilar or in an out group. And we do it automatically. 
In fact, when you look at cross-cultural lie detection, we actually process what's being said by ourselves and what's being said by people from our in-group differently with a different part of the brain than we process things that are being said by people in that out-group. It's a very strong bias. What I call vested interest bias. This is why, you know, we should be the best at knowing if our spouses, if our loved ones, if the people we're dating, if our best friends are liars. And many times we're the worst because we have a vested interest in their telling us the truth. If your boyfriend or girlfriend says, I love you, we have an interest in having that be true. If our child says, you know, no, I didn't do that. I wasn't one of those people that got caught doing that. I, I wasn't even there. We have a vested interest in having that child because we raised that kid. So that kid's got to be pretty good. Anytime you have a vested interest in someone, you are biased toward them being truthful. Appropriate behavior bias is an interesting one, and that is I know, or I think I do, how I'd act if I were telling the truth. So when I see someone who's acting differently, they got to be lying. You see, it's just like grief. People don't grieve the same. Some people, you know, go into a manic kind of high, and some people go into an incredible depression, and some people are somewhere in between, but we're not the same. It's the same way with lying. It's not totally identical, plus, we don't really know how we look when we're telling a lie. We just assume we would look a certain way. We do this all the time when we're watching people on television. He must be lying because look at the way he did something. I would never do that. And confirmation bias. This is the most insidious of all. Let me show you how your brain works. I was raised in Palo Alto. When I graduated from Pali High, my first job was a night job. At that time, we had been living on Oregon Avenue, and in our, you know, the wisdom of my entire family and financial deals, we sold that house because we made, I don't know, $3,000 or something. So obviously, that was a great deal. So my parents then moved, and they were living in and managing this condominium complex. Now, this is the kind of condominiums that are all alike in a row. I'm working nights. I come home, it's like 3 in the morning, I'm tired, and I walk up to the condominium, have my key out, and I notice there's a bicycle. And I thought, well, that, we don't have a bicycle. But, well, okay, my dad also was in the, he did a lot of things, but he also was uh, doing some work with newspapers, maybe it was for some of the newsboys or somebody he had, so he got a bicycle for a prize, or, I don't know. I walk in, I go, hmm, all new furniture. Now, instead of my brain going wrong, 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 my brain does what every brain does, and that is tries to make sense of something I know is true. I know I'm in my parents' house. Therefore, this furniture can be explained. OK, they went out and bought it tonight. I mean, I did this entire, it must have, you know, it probably only took a few seconds. It felt like about five minutes of trying to rationalize what was going on. I looked over, and the door to the lower bedroom was open. This condominium had three bedrooms, two were upstairs, one was below, and my uncle was staying with us, and I said he would never leave the door open. It was only then that I realized it's three in the morning, and I'm standing in some stranger's condominium. <laughs> now, my parents, being the managers, had the master key. I could have walked into any of them, but that's how brains work. Once you've decided you know the truth, once you've seen those eyebrows go down, so you know that you don't like that person, you don't even know why you don't like that person, or he reminds you of somebody you don't like. Once you've made that decision, then you are going to think and look for all the ways that justify that decision. Aha, I knew I couldn't trust him. And, and you will find and give much more meaning. If somebody does this and you like him, you know, oh, that's the way she stands. I've, I've seen her do that a lot of times. If someone does this and you don't like them, aha, resistant, I knew it. See, you can't trust that person. We will read into it once we've made up our mind. All right, the verbal and nonverbal signs of deception. This was the most fun to do. 
We'll do some verbal first. Selective wording. I want you to ask me if I've ever taken drugs. I don't do drugs. Did I answer the question? No. No. Ask me, um, did I leave my last workplace under good conditions? Did you leave your last workplace under good conditions? I love to pursue things that I, you know, were more in line with my skills and talents. Did I answer the question? No. Selective wording. Quasi-denials. That's like, um, I could be wrong, but this is what I think happened. Or, um, I'm not absolutely sure, but it's probably something like this. You already back out of a statement that you're going to make. So quasi-denials, many times, liars will use. Qualifiers. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, um, I could be wrong again. Also, it could be, instead of, on that quasi-denial, instead of, ask me if I stole the computer. Do I look like someone who would steal computers? Did I answer your question? No. See, any time you deflect and move around by selective wording, quasi-denying, qualifying, you're getting some slippery, or you may be getting some slippery answers. Softeners. When someone is being asked about a, a potential crime or you know, a theft, um, a forgery, they will use, when they answer questions, they'll use words like steal, forge, um, hard words. If someone is guilty of that and they're being asked, they will typically soften and talk about things like borrow um, or mistake, overlook. They will soften the language around the, the crime or the, or the situation. Overly formal wording. I did not have sexual relationship with that woman, Ms. Lewinsky. Not, I didn't have sex with Monica, you know. I did not have sex. So, the first thing to look for is if they don't use contractions, if it's did not instead of didn't, that's overly formal. And when they try to distance that woman, she's over there somewhere, I have no idea where she is, that woman, Ms. Lewinsky, overly formal. The other thing to remember is sometimes people actually do tell you the literal truth, but you don't hear it that way. So remember, if your boss says, I'm thinking of putting you up for that new job that's opening in someone else's department. That's exactly what she means. She's not putting you up. She may not put you up, but she's thinking about putting you up. So don't hear more into words than what people say. People will typically tell you the truth, but they'll put it in a way that you can read a lot of things into that. Nonverbal. Here's the science behind detecting lies nonverbally. Most people, if we're not habitual or pathological, or practiced, or any of those other things, when we lie, our brains have to work harder. First of all, we have to remember the truth. Then we have to construct the lie. We have to remember not to tell the truth. We have to remember how, how we might answer some questions around the lie. We have to remember to whom we told the lie. I mean, it is, it's so stressful that for big lies, most of us would much rather tell the truth. It's just a lot easier. You don't have to remember who you said what to. It's just simpler. So when we lie, there's some stress. Our heart rates go up. Blood pressure goes up. Breathing rates get shallow. And those are the things that you start to see in body language. So much of detection of lies is really stress detection. Which means, by the way, that you can't say when you see some of these, oh, that person's lying. What you can say is, we've hit a hot spot. 
something in this question, something in this line of questioning, something that just happened, someone who just came into the room, triggered something because they are acting stressed. So stress signals are anything, typically things like playing with your jewelry. You see people that are nervous start to twirl their rings. Um, they may rub their hands together. They may rub their hands on their legs. They may bounce their feet. You also can do all these things for other reasons. But when you see this at a certain time, it can be very telling. Um, feet, by the way, are incredibly honest. They're the most honest part of your body because they're the farthest from your brain and the least rehearsed. So when somebody is really nervous, you can see them wrap their feet around their, you know, the back of the chair. You can see them do all sorts of very fascinating things with their feet. You can also see them start to point toward the door because they really wish this line of questioning were over and they're ready to go. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen that, that you can see. Um, also, feet can point toward you. You know, so if, if, for instance, you're really engaged in what I'm saying, your feet more likely point toward me. If you're not so engaged, they start pointing other places. Same way in a, in a group, you can tell who really people are interested in because their feet start to point at them. They may be still talking to other folks, but their feet are pointed at the leader or the boss or the most charismatic or, the, or whomever. So feet are a lot of fun to watch. In stress, when you think of stress, you think of fight or flight. But actually, the first sign of stress is what physiologically? freeze. Everybody freezes. So many times what you're looking for is not the fight or flight stuff, the bounciness or the trying to get out of the room. You're looking for all of a sudden people get very still. They start to freeze. If they were animated before and their gestures stop or they hide their hands under the table or you can almost see it in their breathing, they hold their breath. I mean there are lots of things that people do when they freeze that doesn't look like their normal behavior. The most important thing, of course, is to find behaviors that are a deviation from their truth baseline. Now, here's how that works. I'm coming in for a job interview. So before the interview, you offer me a cup of coffee. So while you're all, you don't care if I drink the coffee or not, what you want to see as we're having this chit chat is how, you know, how I gesture, how I talk what my tone of voice is under stress. Our voices get higher. So you want to see if our, my, you know, how are my voices when I'm just chatting about things. Then you do something way before the interview starts, and that is you ask me questions to which you know the answer. So you say, because it's down in your notes, you already know this, but you say, hey, do you, uh, how did you hear about this job opening? You watch me as I answer, because it, I have no reason to lie about that. You can tell. You already know the answer to it. Do you have any friends that work here? You already know that because it's written down. Two people in the organization referred me. You, again, you're looking for a baseline, but you're looking for a baseline of truthful answers. Because tapping feet, if my feet are tapping while I'm saying, oh, yeah, I know a lot of people here, then it's not going to mean anything if you're going to use it as a cue to deceit. But if I'm very calm and I change my behavior when you ask me a question about why I left my last job, and it's different from that truth baseline, then, then you might, again, you might have a hot spot. Telltale four, what you want to do is look for clusters. Now, they can be clusters of verbal and nonverbal. So let's say you are interviewing me again, and you have asked me uh, about why I left my last job, and I've been evasive. And you're writing notes, but all of a sudden you hear that my voice got higher. So that got your attention, and you, and you looked up because you know that when voices get higher, that means stress. And then you see that I'm touching either my necklace or my neck. And because I'm a woman, women tend to, when they're stressed or surprised or thrilled, they tend to, to touch right here the notch at their neck, or they play with jewelry that's close to it, just like you did. Um, <laughs> I mean, we do that. So if all of a sudden my voice got your attention because it was higher, and then you notice another stress signal, and then there was something in that answer that I said, uh, you know, I've, I, I left um, to pursue other things. I didn't really answer your questions. Now you have a cluster of behaviors. And what you might do with that cluster of behaviors is absolutely nothing. You might not say, hey, I noticed you touched your neck and your voice was, you know, you might not do that. You might just kind of put a little asterisk at that question and go on to some other questions. 
you'd notice then if my hand dropped and my voice got lower and I got, I seemed to be more animated. And, and then you might go back to say, if I called your last boss, um, what would he tell me about you? And then again, you'd notice. Because if you now you're getting those reactions twice, there's something about that situation that I haven't been forthcoming. So that's how you would, would use these. The Telltale Four is out of Northeastern University, and they, they did this study, and no one else has replicated it, but I'm just throwing it out to you, that there are four body language cues that if you see them in the course of, say, two, three, four minute conversation, this is the telltale cluster. This means you're talking to a liar. So if they touch their face, if they t rub their hands together, if they pull back, and if they cross their arms. If you get those four, you got a liar, according to this research. So you'll have to tell me. You'll have to be my study group and, and see if, if that's accurate or not. Eye signals. The biggest myth around deception is that liars don't look you in the eye. And partly, children don't, aren't real good at looking you in the eye. Kids are you know, a lot like, more likely to drop their eye contact. But so are people from different cultures. You know, so are people. I mean, there's many, many reasons why someone would drop their eyes. Which is good to know, by the way, when we, when we end up with this about how not to look like a liar. So I'll go back to that in a minute. But right now, just know that there's no research that says that liars don't look you in the eyes. In fact, good liars, or maybe not so good liars, actually overcompensate, because they've heard that too. So they look you too much in the eyes. And pretty soon you think, why isn't he just stop looking at me? You know, she's just staring at me. Is this getting creepy? And because I'm trying to make sure that you know that I'm telling the truth. But there are some eye signals that actually are valid. Um, the, another one that isn't valid, by the way, is the neuro linguistic programming, the NLP work about if you look up to the right, it means something. If you look up to the left, it means something. There, it probably does mean something. I'm not saying that it's, it's it, incorrect with that. But there is no correlation to where your eye moves and if you're lying or not. I was taught that. I was taught that if your eyes moved to a certain direction, it meant you were constructing a truth rather than recalling a truth. But studies now say not so much. What is true, though, because I've tested this on my sister, is if you know where people's eyes go when they are answer in their truth baseline, when you say, do you have, you know, I know you know a couple people who work here. Who are they? And you see them, oh, yeah, it was Francis and then Jacob. And you notice where their eyes go. And then you ask them something later, and their eyes go to the other side as if they're getting information from another part of their brain. That would be telling, regardless of which side their eyes go to. The other thing that happens in lying is that your eyes dilate. Now, there are a lot of places your eyes dilate. Dilates in darkness, dilates when you're in love with someone and you're gazing at each other's eyes. Your eyes are both dilated. Check that out, everyone. Um, <laughs> it, but also, again, that effort of lying. So here, and this is very confusing, because if you're in love with someone and your eyes dilate, but if you're lying to them saying, I'm in love with you, their eyes will also dilate. So maybe this isn't a good cue <laughs> for that. Use it for something else. So eyes do dilate under the strain of having to create the lie. And then there's a blink rate. When the liar is lying, the blink rate goes down. The minute the lie is after it's constructed and told, the blink rate is low. And after the lie is told, oftentimes liar's blink rate will increase up to eight times. Now, blink rate makes people look nervous. I know when I was doing some of the watching the presidential campaigns, high blink rates are not good for a presidential candidate because it makes them look like they're lying or unsure. But literally, if their blink rate is low and then it goes up to after they've said something, that would be a better indicator than just normal blink rate. And emotional incongruence. This is where I think a lot of people who are good at detecting lies, find, it's kind of that gut feeling you get when something is off. And that could be because you don't know it, but you're really pretty good at spotting micro expressions, those expressions that hit for a fraction of a second and then get caught immediately and 
replaced, usually with a phony smile, which is our favorite replacement sign for anything we don't want people to see, any other emotion. When something is off, when something with their body language is off, when someone says, like a, a, an executive that I saw speak, was asking for questions, and he said, now I'm open for questions. I mean, there's something, I mean, you and I laughed, that entire audience, not one person caught that, that they, they couldn't come up with any questions. It was such a dichotomy between what he was saying and what his body was displaying. So those are the things that you catch unconsciously or consciously now, more, more often, um, and that will make you think somebody's lying. So you want to, that's that gut feeling, you want to pay attention to it. There is something, though, that emotions won't tell you. A liar can look incredibly fearful that he's going to be caught. But so can a truthful person look very fearful that you're not going to believe him. So fear, you're not mind reading. What you're doing is picking up an emotion. And you can be pretty good at that. You can say, OK, I know that's fear. But you cannot say what generated that fear. Liars. You, when it comes to the chapter that I wrote on how to deal with liars, really interesting stuff, because you've got a lot of choices. You can report a liar. You can confront a liar. You can ignore a liar. Or you can thank a liar. You know, thank the one that tells you how good you look when you really don't feel that good. But here are the questions. See, and unlike other things, I can't give you the five things to do, but I can give you the few questions to ask so you can build your own strategy, because it really depends. First of all, it depends on your legal obligation. When you go into the workplace or the classroom, if you're teaching, you're going to have some legal obligations. You are going to have to report pornography, even your own. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. You're going to have to report pornography. You're going to have to report um, child abuse. You're going to have to report certain sexual abuses. I mean, those things are mandated. And you, there's no getting out of that. Those things you have to report. You don't have, you can't ignore them. You can't ignore them legally. You can't ignore them ethically or morally. You're also going to be in an organization that has certain policies for reporting. And you're going to have to know what those policies are and follow them. Because if, particularly if you want to report someone and you don't follow procedure and you do something else, it's, it's going to come back and hit you in the face, not them. It'll be, why didn't you do it the right way? You weren't, you weren't supposed to go to your boss's boss. You were supposed to go to HR you were, what, or whatever. So you want to make sure you know how that, how that works. It also depends on who the liar is. If the liar is someone you're negotiating with, you're going to respond to that maybe very differently than if the liar is your boss, or if the liar is someone who reports to you, or if the liar is one of your coworkers, a colleague, a friend. It depends on what the impact of the lie is. And if you're going to report liars, by the way, this is what you need to document. You can't go into HR or your boss or your boss's boss or to whomever and say, my feelings were really hurt when this person lied to me. I am so upset. They don't really care. But you could go in and say, this lie is damaging team morale. It, you need to give them some impact on the team or the organization or the project, something that makes some kind of not only personal, you can certainly say how it's affecting you personally, but the more you can document the impact of the lie in a bigger arena, the better it is. And this is very interesting. What do you want the liar to do? Do you want her to resign? Do you want her to be fired? Do you just want her to know that you know? Do you want her simply to go somewhere else because you know she's a big liar and you never want to work with her again, but you just don't even want her to even know that you know? Um, do you want her to apologize? Do you want her to retract the lie? What is it that you want? And depending on those answers, it's going to be different. And then when you figure that out, you need to think, what are the possible consequences of doing all of these things? When you report a liar, 
you may or may not get the reaction you were hoping for. That liar may not be fired. That liar, you may be moved to another division. I've seen this happen. You know, I mean, you just don't know what, what the outcome is. You need to really think that through. If the liar is someone who is well respected in the organization and you're new to the company, you're going to have to really have a lot of evidence before anything you say is going to outweigh that person's reputation. Um, directly confronting has some impact that you might not want. If you have to work with that person on an ongoing basis, you might want to ha not have a direct confrontation. You might want to do something a little more indirect. There are a lot of ways to do that as well. And of course, doing nothing has its own implications. Doing nothing, by the way, does not mean that you forgive the liar. It simply means you've chosen not to deal with it at this time. And many times someone says, I did nothing, but I will never, ever, ever trust that person again. OK, and the last piece I want to talk about just briefly is how not to look like a liar when you're telling the truth. Two things. Number one is, if most people realize and are picking up on stress cues, you need to manage your stress. If you go into a job interview and you're just nervous, you're going to look nervous, but you also may look that you're, like you're not forthcoming or you're not entirely candid. So what you want to do is decrease your cortisol level, your stress hormone level, and increase your testosterone, which is your power hormone. And you can do that in two ways. One is that two-minute exercise called power poses. And you obviously do this in the men's or ladies' room before the interview. By the way, you do not walk in and do this at the interview, but where you take up as much room as you possibly can and you hold that pose for two minutes. Doing that literally increases the amount of testosterone. You are more likely to take risks. You walk in, you keep more of that in your posture as you walk in, and you are perceived as more powerful and more comfortable because you have also lowered that cortisol level simply by holding your body in a high power pose for two minutes. So power posing is one way. Um, power thinking is another way. And what they've found is it doesn't take much, but right before that interview, be very careful about what you're thinking. Because if you will, I always tell people keep a success log. Let's say you just bombed in another interview, and now you got to go to this one. You better have a way to drop this fast and remind yourself of how terrific you are. So just by reading or mentally reviewing times when you just aced it, when you were brilliant and clever and wonderful, you will go in there and you will actually behave differently. And they can quantify that. It doesn't take much time at all. In fact, that's what method actors do. They go back into time to find a place where they were emotionally valid, frightened, if they're going to do a, a scary scene. So they can take that emotion of fear, authentic emotion of fear, into that new scene. So it's something actors do all the time, but it's amazing now the research they've done, and it's particularly good for job interviews. So remember those two things, power pose and that power thinking kind of thing. And by the way, when you are in the waiting room, what you don't want to do is bring your smartphone, because what does your body do? It hunches over, it does this. What you have done now is you've decreased your testosterone and increased your stress hormones, cortisol level. Bring a newspaper, you know, stretch so your hands can actually stretch out. I mean, it, there is something to this, so make it work in your favor. And of course, the other thing is, since most people believe that eye contact is important, even if it's not in your cultural heritage to have that kind of eye, extended eye contact, I don't, and not stalk or stare, we're not going there. We're simply talking about, you know, looking at someone maybe 60% of the time particularly when they're talking, so that you make that connection, you will simply look more candid. Now, I want to tell you one quick story, and I won't probably have time for questions. So what do you want, a story or questions? 
I can do either because we have five minutes. All right. I was asked this uh, last year, I was asked to go to North Dakota and work with the Department of Commerce, work with the leadership team at the Department of Commerce. So I went back there and I met Tracy. And Tracy said, you know, I attended another speech that you gave, and only because of that can I tell you this story. She said, I am very truthful. I pride myself on my truthfulness and my candor and my ability to build trust in a team. So when my organization, my leadership team, said we're going to do a trust survey, I was, I was the first to sign up. And then I got the results. And two of the people I report to said the same thing. You look like you have a hidden agenda. You look like you're not totally forthcoming. It seems as if you're holding things back. Well, you can imagine. I mean, Tracy was devastated. So she thought, as most people will, OK, I'll meet with those leaders, and I'll find out what I can do differently. So she had a meeting, and they said, all right, here's what we suggest. Before you present an idea, maybe you need to give us more of the backstory. So it doesn't look like there's something so self-serving. Here's what I've been thinking about. Here's why I decided this idea would be good for the organization. Months and months Tracy worked on this. Backstory, did the whole thing, present her ideas. Next year, trust survey, same result. You don't look candid. You're not telling us the whole thing. It looks like you have a hidden agenda. And she said, then I heard you speak. And I thought, could it be something I'm doing with my body? So she thought, she said, you know, we're in North Dakota. It's pretty cold here in the winter. You know, I called them because I'm going back there in the fall to do another thing for the governor's conference. But I, I called them, and they, they tell me the high today is 12 below. I mean, you know, that's cold to me. So anyway. She said, it's pretty cold here. And she said, and I'm naturally cold anyway. So I would sit in the meetings, and I would, I would kind of huddle up, cross my arms, and, and it, pull my body in. And she said, so I wondered if, if I didn't do that, if I would come across differently. So she said, so I layered. You know, she, I was wearing like five sweaters, and a, but I was comfortable. And she said, so I uncrossed my arms. I would gesture with my arms. Hands showing, more sweeping gestures, more inclusive, warmer kind of looks. And that was it. The next trust survey, highly trustworthy, very candid. I mean, it was amazing. When people talk to me about impression management, and they say, well, Carol, if you're telling us in an interview, you know, you stand like this before you go in, and you, you, know, you, you, you have to layer if you're going to be in a cold room. I mean, isn't that just? kind of lying? Isn't that kind of manipulative? And I say, yeah, sure. It's just as manipulative as uh, spell checking your resume before you send it in, or dressing for success before you go on that, or minding your manners. You know, if you're going out for a business lunch, all of those, very manipulative and highly recommended, by the way. <laughs> Body language is when you're working on impression management, it's not to fool people that you're something you're not. Because you really are smart. You really are good. You really are talented. And you really are candid. So why don't you just look that way? All right, that's it. Thank you so much. Really great. World.